A Dam Attack by Ajahn Shah. The Peace Beyond One. It's of great importance that we practice the Dhamma. If we don't practice, then all our knowledge is only superficial knowledge, just the outer shell of it. It's as if we have some sort of fruit but we haven't eaten it yet. Even though we have that fruit in our hand we get no benefit from it. Only through the actual eating of the fruit will we really know its taste. The Buddha didn't praise those who merely believe others, he praised the person who knows within himself. Just as with that fruit, if we have tasted it already, we don't have to ask anyone else if it's sweet or sour. Our problems are over. Why are they over? Because we see according to the truth. One who has realized the Dhamma is like one who has realized the sweetness or sourness of the fruit. All doubts are ended right here. When we talk about Dhamma, although we may say a lot, it can usually be brought down to four things. They are simply to know suffering, to know the cause of suffering, to know the end of suffering and to know the path of practice leading to the end of suffering. This is all there is. All that we have experienced on the path of practice so far comes down to these four things. When we know these things, our problems are over. Where are these four things born? They are born just within the body and the mind, nowhere else. So why is the teaching of the Buddha so detailed and extensive? This is so in order to explain these things in a more refined way, to help us to see them. When Siddhartha Gautama was born into the world, before he saw the Dhamma, he was an ordinary person just like us. When he knew what he had to know, that is the truth of suffering, the cause, the end, and the way leading to the end of suffering, he realized the Dhamma and became a perfectly enlightened Buddha. When we realize the Dhamma, wherever we sit we know Dhamma, wherever we are we hear the Buddha's teaching. When we understand Dhamma, the Buddha is within our mind, the Dhamma is within our mind, and the practice leading to wisdom is within our own mind. Having the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha within our mind means that whether our actions are good or bad, we know clearly for ourselves their true nature. That is how the Buddha discarded worldly opinions, praise, and criticism. When people praised or criticized him he just accepted it for what it was. These two things are simply worldly conditions so he wasn't shaken by them. Why not? Because he knew suffering. He knew that if he believed in that praise or criticism they would cause him to suffer. When suffering arises it agitates us, we feel ill at ease. What is the cause of that suffering? It's because we don't know the truth, this is the cause. When the cause is present, then suffering arises. Once arisen we don't know how to stop it. The more we try to stop it, the more it comes on. We say, don't criticize me or don't blame me. Trying to stop it like this, suffering really comes on, it won't stop. So the Buddha taught that the way leading to the end of suffering is to make the Dhamma arise as a reality within our own minds. We become those who witness the Dhamma for themselves. If someone says we are good we don't get lost in it, they say we are no good and we don't forget ourselves. This way we can be free. Good and evil are just worldly Dhammas, they are just states of mind. If we follow them our mind becomes the world, we just grope in the darkness and don't know the way out. If it's like this then we have not yet mastered ourselves. We try to defeat others, but in doing so we only defeat ourselves. But if we have mastery over ourselves then we have mastery over all over all mental formations, sights, sounds, smells, tastes and bodily feelings. Now I'm talking about externals, they're like that, but the outside is reflected inside also. Some people only know the outside, they don't know the inside. Like when we say to see the body in the body. Having seen the outer body is not enough, we must know the body within the body. Then, having investigated the mind, we should know the mind within the mind. Why should we investigate the body? What is this body in the body? When we say to know the mind, what is this mind? If we don't know the mind then we don't know the things within the mind. This is to be someone who doesn't know suffering, doesn't know the cause, doesn't know the end and doesn't know the way leading to the end of suffering. The things which should help to extinguish suffering don't help, because we get distracted by the things which aggravate it. 
It's just as if we have an itch on our head and we scratch our leg. If it's our head that's itchy then we're obviously not going to get much relief. In the same way, when suffering arises we don't know how to handle it, we don't know the practice leading to the end of suffering. For instance, take this body, this body that each of us has brought along to this meeting. If we just see the form of the body there's no way we can escape suffering. Why not? Because we still don't see the inside of the body, we only see the outside. We only see it as something beautiful, something substantial. The Buddha said that only this is not enough. We see the outside with our eyes, a child can see it, animals can see it, it's not difficult. The outside of the body is easily seen, but having seen it we stick to it, we don't know the truth of it. Having seen it we grab onto it and it bites us. So we should investigate the body within the body. Whatever's in the body, go ahead and look at it. If we just see the outside it's not clear. We see hair, nails, and so on and they are just pretty things which entice us, so the Buddha taught to see the inside of the body, to see the body within the body. What is in the body? Look closely within. We will find many surprises inside, because even though they are within us, we've never seen them. Wherever we walk we carry them with us, sitting in a car we carry them with us, but we still don't know them at all. It's as if we visit some relatives at their house and they give us a present. We take it and put it in our bag and then leave without opening it to see what is inside. When at last we open it, full of poisonous snakes. Our body is like this. If we just see the shell of it we say it's fine and beautiful. We forget ourselves. We forget impermanence, suffering and not self. If we look within this body it's really repulsive. If we look according to reality, without trying to sugar things over, we'll see that it's really pitiful and wearisome. Dispassion will arise. This feeling of disinterest is not that we feel aversion for the world or anything. It's simply our mind clearing up, our mind letting go. We see things as not substantial or dependable, but that all things are naturally established just as they are. However we want them to be, they just go their own way regardless. Whether we laugh or cry, they simply are the way they are. Things which are unstable are unstable, things which are not beautiful are not beautiful. So the Buddha said that when we experience sights, sounds, tastes, smells, bodily feelings or mental states, we should release them. When the ear hears sounds, let them go. When the nose smells an odor, let it go, just leave it at the nose. When bodily feelings arise, let go of the like or dislike that follow, let them go back to their birthplace. The same for mental states. All these things, just let them go their way. This is knowing. Whether it's happiness or unhappiness, it's all the same. This is called meditation. Meditation means to make the mind peaceful in order to let wisdom arise. This requires that we practice with body and mind in order to see and know the sense impressions of form, sound, taste, smell, touch and mental formations. To put it shortly, it's just a matter of happiness and unhappiness. Happiness is pleasant feeling in the mind, unhappiness is just unpleasant feeling. The Buddha taught to separate this happiness and unhappiness from the mind. The mind is that which knows. Feeling too is the characteristic of happiness or unhappiness, like or dislike. When the mind indulges in these things we say that it clings to or takes that happiness and unhappiness to be worthy of holding. That clinging is an action of mind, that happiness or unhappiness is feeling. When we say the Buddha told us to separate the mind from the feeling, he didn't literally mean to throw them to different places. He meant that the mind must know happiness and know unhappiness. When sitting in Samdhi, for example, and peace fills the mind, then happiness comes but it doesn't reach us, unhappiness comes but doesn't reach us. This is to separate the feeling from the mind. We can compare it to oil and water in a bottle. They don't combine. Even if you try to mix them, the oil remains oil and the water remains water, because they are of different density. The natural state of the mind is neither happiness nor unhappiness. When feeling enters the mind then happiness or unhappiness is born. 
If we have mindfulness then we know pleasant feeling as pleasant feeling. The mind which knows will not pick it up. Happiness is there but it's outside the mind, not buried within the mind. The mind simply knows it clearly. If we separate unhappiness from the mind, does that mean there is no suffering, that we don't experience it? Yes, we experience it, but we know mind as mind, feeling as feeling. We don't cling to that feeling or carry it around. The Buddha separated these things through knowledge. Did he have suffering? He knew the state of suffering but he didn't cling to it, so we say that he cut suffering off. And there was happiness too, but he knew that happiness, if it's not known, is like a poison. He didn't hold it to be himself. Happiness was there through knowledge, but it didn't exist in his mind. Thus we say that he separated happiness and unhappiness from his mind. When we say that the Buddha and the enlightened ones killed defilements, it's not that they really killed them. If they had killed all defilements then we probably wouldn't have any. They didn't kill defilements, when they knew them for what they are, they let them go. Someone who's stupid will grab them, but the enlightened ones knew the defilements in their own minds as a poison, so they swept them out. They swept out the things which caused them to suffer, they didn't kill them. One who doesn't know this will see some things, such as happiness, as good, and then grab them, but the Buddha just knew them and simply brushed them away. But when feeling arises for us we indulge in it, that is, the mind carries that happiness and unhappiness around. In fact they are two different things. The activities of mind, pleasant feeling, unpleasant feeling, and so on, are mental impressions, they are the world. If the mind knows this it can equally do work involving happiness or unhappiness. Why? Because it knows the truth of these things. Someone who doesn't know them sees them as having different value, but one who knows sees them as equal. If you cling to happiness it will be the birthplace of unhappiness later on, because happiness is unstable, it changes all the time. When happiness disappears, unhappiness arises. The Buddha knew that because both happiness and unhappiness are unsatisfactory, they have the same value. When happiness arose he let it go. He had right practice seeing that both these things have equal values and drawbacks. They come under the law of Dhamma, that is, they are unstable and unsatisfactory. Once born, they die. When he saw this, right view arose, the right way of practice became clear. No matter what sort of feeling or thinking arose in his mind, he knew it as simply the continuous play of happiness and unhappiness. He didn't cling to them. When the Buddha was newly enlightened he gave a sermon about indulgence in pleasure and indulgence in pain. Monks Indulgence in pleasure is the loose way, indulgence in pain is the tense way. These were the two things that disturbed his practice until the day he was enlightened, because at first he didn't let go of them. When he knew them, he let them go, and so was able to give his first sermon. So we say that a meditator should not walk the way of happiness or unhappiness, rather he should know them. Knowing the truth of suffering, he will know the cause of suffering, the end of suffering and the way leading to the end of suffering. And the way out of suffering is meditation itself. To put it simply, we must be mindful. Mindfulness is knowing, or presence of mind. Right now what are we thinking, what are we doing? What do we have with us right now? We observe like this, we are aware of how we are living. Practicing like this, wisdom can arise. We consider and investigate at all times, in all postures. When a mental impression arises that we like we know it as such, we don't hold it to be anything substantial. It's J-U-S-T happiness. When unhappiness arises we know that it's indulgence in pain, it's not the path of a meditator. This is what we call separating the mind from the feeling. If we are clever we don't attach we leave things be. We become the one who knows. The mind and feeling are just like oil and water, they are in the same bottle but they don't mix. Even if we are sick or in pain, we still know the feeling as feeling, the mind as mind. We know the painful or comfortable states but we don't identify with them. We stay only with peace, the peace beyond both comfort and pain. You should understand it like this, 
because if there is no permanent self then there is no refuge. You must live like this, that is, without happiness and without unhappiness. You stay only with the knowing, you don't carry things around. As long as we are still unenlightened all this may sound strange but it doesn't matter, we just set our goal in this direction. The mind is the mind. It meets happiness and unhappiness and we see them as merely that, there's nothing more to it. They are divided, not mixed. If they are all mixed up then we don't know them. It's like living in a house, the house and its occupant are related, but separate. If there is danger in our house we are distressed because we must protect it, but if the house catches fire we get out of it. If painful feeling arises we get out of it, just like that house. When it's full of fire and we know it, we come running out of it. They are separate things, the house is one thing, the occupant is another. We say that we separate mind and feeling in this way but in fact they are by nature already separate. Our realization is simply to know this natural separateness according to reality. When we say they are not separated it's because we're clinging to them through ignorance of the truth. So the Buddha told us to meditate. This practice of meditation is very important. Merely to know with the intellect is not enough. The knowledge which arises from practice with a peaceful mind and the knowledge which comes from study are really far apart. The knowledge which comes from study is not real knowledge of our mind. The mind tries to hold on to and keep this knowledge. Why do we try to keep it? Just to lose it. And then when it's lost we cry. If we really know, then there's letting go, leaving things be. We know how things are and don't forget ourselves. If it happens that we are sick we don't get lost in that. Some people think, this year I was sick the whole time. I couldn't meditate at all. These are the words of a really foolish person. Someone who's sick or dying should really be diligent in his practice. One may say he doesn't have time to meditate. He's sick, he's suffering, he doesn't trust his body, and so he feels that he can't meditate. If we think like this then things are difficult. T. He Buddha didn't teach like that. He said that right here is the place to meditate. When we're sick or almost dying that's when we can really know and see reality. Other people say they don't have the chance to meditate because they're too busy. Sometimes school teachers come to see me. They say they have many responsibilities so there's no time to meditate. I ask them, when you're teaching do you have time to breathe? They answer, yes. So how can you have time to breathe if the work is so hectic and confusing? Here you are far from Dhamma. Actually this practice is just about the mind and its feelings. It's not something that you have to run after or struggle for. Breathing continues while working. Nature takes care of the natural processes, all we have to do is try to be aware. Just to keep trying, going inwards to see clearly. Meditation is like this. If we have that presence of mind then whatever work we do will be the very tool which enables us to know right and wrong continually. There's plenty of time to meditate, we just don't fully understand the practice, that's all. While sleeping we breathe, eating we breathe, don't we? Why don't we have time to meditate? Wherever we are we breathe. If we think like this then our life has as much value as our breath, wherever we are we have time. All kinds of thinking are mental conditions, not conditions of body, so we need simply have presence of mind then we will know right and wrong at all times. Standing, walking, sitting and lying, there's plenty of time. We just don't know how to use it properly. Please consider this. We cannot run away from feeling, we must know it. Feeling is just feeling, happiness is just happiness, unhappiness is just unhappiness. They are simply that. So why should we cling to them? If the mind is clever, Simply to hear this is enough to enable us to separate feeling from the mind. If we investigate like this continuously the mind will find release, but it's not escaping through ignorance. The mind lets go, but it knows. It doesn't let go through stupidity, not because it doesn't want things to be the way they are. It lets go because it knows according to the truth. This is seeing nature, the reality that's all around us. 
when we know this we are someone who skilled with the mind, we are skilled with mental impressions. When we are skilled with mental impressions we are skilled with the world. This is to be a knower of the world. The Buddha was someone who clearly knew the world with all its difficulty. He knew the troublesome, and that which was not troublesome was right there. This world is so confusing, how is it that the Buddha was able to know it? Here we should understand that the Dhamma taught by the Buddha is not beyond our ability. In all postures we should have presence of mind and self-awareness, and when it's time to sit meditation we do that. We sit in meditation to establish peacefulness and cultivate mental energy. We don't do it in order to play around at anything special. Insight meditation is sitting in Samdhi itself. At some places they say, now we are going to sit in Samdhi, after that we'll do insight meditation. Don't divide them like this. Tranquility is the base which gives rise to wisdom. Wisdom is the fruit of tranquility. To say that now we are going to do calm meditation, later we'll do insight, you can't do that. You can only divide them in speech. Just like a knife, the blade is on one side, the back of the blade on the other. You can't divide them. If you pick up one side you get both sides. Tranquility gives rise to wisdom like this. Morality is the father and mother of Dhamma. In the beginning we must have morality. Morality is peace. This means that there are no wrongdoings in body or speech. When we don't do wrong then we don't get agitated, when we don't become agitated then peace and collectedness arise within the mind. So we say that morality, concentration and wisdom are the path on which all the noble ones have walked to enlightenment. They are all one. Morality is concentration, concentration is morality. Concentration is wisdom, wisdom is concentration. It's like a mango. When it's a flower we call it a flower. When it becomes a fruit we call it a mango. When it ripens we call it a ripe mango. It's all one mango but it continually changes. The big mango grows from the small mango, the small mango becomes a big one. You can call them different fruits or all one. Morality, concentration and wisdom are related like this. In the end it's all the path that leads to enlightenment. The mango, from the moment it first appears as a flower, simply grows to ripeness. This is enough, we should see it like this. Whatever others call it, it doesn't matter. Once it's born it grows to old age, and then where? We should contemplate this. Some people don't want to be old. When they get old they become depressed. These people shouldn't eat ripe mangoes. Why do we want the mangoes to be ripe? If they're not ripe in time, we ripen them artificially, don't we? But when we become old we are filled with regret. Some people cry, they're afraid to get old or die. If it's like this then they shouldn't eat ripe mangoes, better eat just the flowers. If we can see this then we can see the Dhamma. Everything clears up, we are at peace. Just determine to practice like that. Today the chief privy counselor and his party have come together to hear the Dhamma. You should take what I've said and contemplate it. If anything is not right, please excuse me. But for you to know whether it's right or wrong depends on your practicing and seeing for yourselves. Whatever's wrong, throw it out. If it's right then take it and use it. But actually we practice in order to let go of both right and wrong. In the end we just throw everything out. If it's right, throw it out, wrong, throw it out. Usually if it's right we cling to rightness, if it's wrong we hold it to be wrong, and then arguments follow. But the Dhamma is the place where there's nothing, nothing at all. Footnotes 1. A condensed version of a talk given to the Chief Privy Councillor of Thailand, Mr. Sanya Dermay Sakti, at Wat Nong Pa Pong, 1978. 2. Feeling is a translation of the plea word Vedan, and should be understood in the sense Ajahn Chah herein describes it, as the mental states of pleasure and pain. A Dam Attack by Ajahn Chah Opening the Dam Eye one some of us start to practice, and even after a year or two, still don't know what's what. We are still unsure of the practice. When we're still unsure, 
we don't see that everything around us is purely Dhamma, and so we turn to teachings from the Ajans. But actually, when we know our own mind, when there is sati to look closely at the mind, there is wisdom. All times and all places become occasions for us to hear the Dhamma. We can learn Dhamma from nature, from trees for example. A tree is born due to causes and it grows following the course of nature. Right here the tree is teaching us Dhamma, but we don't understand this. In due course, it grows and grows until it buds, flowers and fruit appear. All we see is the appearance of the flowers and fruit, we're unable to bring this within and contemplate it. Thus we don't know that the tree is teaching us Dhamma. The fruit appears and we merely eat it without investigating, sweet, sour, or salty, it's the nature of the fruit. And this is Dhamma, the teaching of the fruit. Following on, the leaves grow old. They wither, die, and then fall from the tree. All we see is that the leaves have fallen down. We step on them, we sweep them up, that's all. We don't investigate thoroughly, so we don't know that nature is teaching us. Later on the new leaves sprout, and we merely see that, without taking it further. We don't bring these things into our minds to contemplate. If we can bring all this inwards and investigate it, we will see that the birth of a tree and our own birth are no different. This body of ours is born and exists dependent on conditions, on the elements of earth, water, wind, and fire. It has its food, it grows and grows. Every part of the body changes and flows according to its nature. It's no different from the tree, hair, nails, teeth, and skin, all change. If we know the things of nature, then we will know ourselves. People are born. In the end they die. Having died they are born again. Nails, teeth, and skin are constantly dying and regrowing. If we understand the practice then we can see that a tree is no different from ourselves. If we understand the teaching of the Ajans, then we realize that the outside and the inside are comparable. Things which have consciousness and those without consciousness do not differ. They are the same. And if we understand the sameness, then when we see the nature of a tree, for example, we will know that it's no different from our own five candas too, body, feeling, memory, thinking and consciousness. If we have this understanding then we understand Dhamma. If we understand Dhamma we understand the five khandhas, how they constantly shift and change, never stopping. So whether standing, walking, sitting or lying we should have sati to watch over and look after the mind. When we see external things it's like seeing internals. When we see internals it's the same as seeing externals. If we understand this then we can hear the teaching of the Buddha. If we understand this, then we can say that Buddha nature, the one who knows, has been established. It knows the external. It knows the internal. It understands all things which arise. Understanding like this, then sitting at the foot of a tree we hear the Buddha's teaching. Standing, walking, sitting or lying, we hear the Buddha's teaching. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching and thinking, we hear the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha is just this one who knows within this very mind. It knows the Dhamma, it investigates the Dhamma. It's not that the Buddha who lived so long ago comes to talk to us, but this Buddha nature, the one who knows arises. The mind becomes illumined. If we establish the Buddha within our mind then we see everything, we contemplate everything, as no different from ourselves. We see the different animals, trees, mountains, and vines as no different from ourselves. We see poor people and rich people, they're no different from us. Black people and white people, no different. They all have the same characteristics. One who understands like this is content wherever he is. He listens to the Buddha's teaching at all times. If we don't understand this, then even if we spend all our time listening to teachings from the Ajans, we still won't understand their meaning. The Buddha said that enlightenment of the Dhamma is just knowing nature, the reality which is all around us, the nature three which is right here. If we don't understand this nature we experience disappointment and joy. We get lost in moods, 
giving rise to sorrow and regret. Getting lost in mental objects is getting lost in nature. When we get lost in nature then we don't know Dhamma. The enlightened one merely pointed out this nature. Having arisen, all things change and die. Things we make, such as plates, bowls, and dishes, all have the same characteristic. A bowl is molded into being due to a cause, man's impulse to create, and as we use it, it gets old, breaks up and disappears. Trees, mountains, and vines are the same, right up to animals and people. When A.A. with Makron Kandana, the first disciple, heard the Buddha's teaching for the first time, the realization he had was nothing very complicated. He simply saw that whatever thing is born, that thing must change and grow old as a natural condition and eventually it must die. A.A. with Makron Kandana had never thought of this before, or if he had it wasn't thoroughly clear, so he hadn't yet let go, he still clung to the Kandas. As he sat mindfully listening to the Buddha's discourse, Buddha nature arose in him. He received a sort of Dhamma transmission which was the knowledge that all conditioned things are impermanent. Anything which is born must have aging and death as a natural result. This feeling was different from anything he'd ever known before. He truly realized his mind, and so Buddha arose within him. At that time the Buddha declared that A.A. with Makron Kandana had received the Eye of Dhamma. What is it that this Eye of Dhamma sees? This Eye sees that whatever is born has aging and death as a natural result. Whatever is born means everything. Whether material or immaterial, it all comes under this whatever is born. It refers to all of nature. Like this body for instance, it's born and then proceeds to extinction. When it's small it dies from smallness to youth. After a while it dies from youth and becomes middle-aged. Then it goes on to die from middle age and reach old age, finally reaching the end. Trees, mountains, and vines all have this characteristic. So the vision or understanding of the one who knows clearly entered the mind of A.A. with Makron Kandana as he sat there. This knowledge of whatever is born became deeply embedded in his mind, enabling him to uproot attachment to the body. This attachment was Sakayaditha. This means that he didn't take the body to be a self or a being, he didn't see it in terms of he or me. He didn't cling to it. He saw it clearly, thus uprooting Sakayaditha. And then Visakich, doubt, was destroyed. Having uprooted attachment to the body he didn't doubt his realization. Slabhataparmsafor was also uprooted. His practice became firm and straight. Even if his body was in pain or fever he didn't grasp it, he didn't doubt. He didn't doubt, because he had uprooted clinging. This grasping of the body is called slabhataparmsa. When one uproots the view of the body being the self, grasping and doubt are finished with. If just this view of the body as the self arises within the mind then grasping and doubt begin right there. So as the Buddha expounded the Dhamma, A.A. with Makron Kandana opened the eye of Dhamma. This eye is just the one who knows clearly. It sees things differently. It sees this very nature. Seeing nature clearly, clinging is uprooted and the one who knows is born. Previously he knew but he still had clinging. You could say that he knew the Dhamma but he still hadn't seen it, or he had seen the Dhamma but still wasn't one with it. At this time the Buddha said, Kandana knows. What did he know? He knew nature. Usually we get lost in nature, as with this body of ours. Earth, water, fire, and wind come together to make this body. It's an aspect of nature, a material object we can see with the eye. It exists depending on food, growing and changing until finally it reaches extinction. Coming inwards, that which watches over the body is consciousness, just this one who knows, this single awareness. If it receives through the eye it's called seeing. If it receives through the ear it's called hearing, through the nose it's called smelling. Through the tongue, tasting, through the body, touching, and through the mind, thinking. This consciousness is just one but when it functions at different places we call it different things. Through the eye we call it one thing, through the ear we call it another. 
but whether it functions at the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, or mind it's just one awareness. Following the scriptures we call it the six consciousnesses, but in reality there is only one consciousness arising at these six different bases. There are six doors but a single awareness, which is this very mind. This mind is capable of knowing the truth of nature. If the mind still has obstructions, then we say it knows through ignorance. It knows wrongly and it sees wrongly. Knowing wrongly and seeing wrongly, or knowing and seeing rightly, it's just a single awareness. We call it wrong view and right view but it's just one thing. Right and wrong both arise from this one place. When there is wrong knowledge we say that ignorance conceals the truth. When there is wrong knowledge then there is wrong view, wrong intention, wrong action, wrong livelihood, everything is wrong. And on the other hand the path of right practice is born in this same place. When there is right then the wrong disappears. The Buddha practiced enduring many hardships and torturing himself with fasting and so on, but he investigated deeply into his mind until finally he uprooted ignorance. All the Buddhas were enlightened in mind, because the body knows nothing. You can let it eat or not, it doesn't matter, it can die at any time. The Buddhas all practiced with the mind. They were enlightened in mind. The Buddha, having contemplated his mind, gave up the two extremes of practice, indulgence in pleasure and indulgence in pain, and in his first discourse expounded the middle way between these two. But we hear his teaching and it grates against our desires. We're infatuated with pleasure and comfort, infatuated with happiness, thinking we are good, we are fine, this is indulgence in pleasure. It's not the right path. Dissatisfaction, displeasure, dislike, and anger, this is indulgence in pain. These are the extreme ways which one on the path of practice should avoid. These ways are simply the happiness and unhappiness which arise. The one on the path is this very mind, the one who knows. If a good mood arises we cling to it as good, this is indulgence in pleasure. If an unpleasant mood arises we cling to it through dislike, this is indulgence in pain. These are the wrong paths, they aren't the ways of a meditator. They're the ways of the worldly, those who look for fun and happiness and shun unpleasantness and suffering. The wise know the wrong paths but they relinquish them, they give them up. They are unmoved by pleasure and pain, happiness and suffering. These things arise but those who know don't cling to them, they let them go according to their nature. This is right view. When one knows this fully there is liberation. Happiness and unhappiness have no meaning for an enlightened one. The Buddha said that the enlightened ones were far from defilements. This doesn't mean that they ran away from defilements, they didn't run away anywhere. Defilements were there. He compared it to a lotus leaf in a pond of water. The leaf and the water exist together, they are in contact, but the leaf doesn't become damp. The water is like defilements and the lotus leaf is the enlightened mind. The mind of one who practices is the same. It doesn't run away anywhere, it stays right there. Good, evil, happiness and unhappiness, right and wrong arise, and he knows them all. The meditator simply knows them, they don't enter his mind. That is, he has no clinging. He is simply the experiencer. To say he simply experiences is our common language. In the language of Dhamma we say he lets his mind follow the middle way. These activities of happiness, unhappiness, and so on are constantly arising because they are characteristics of the world. The Buddha was enlightened in the world, he contemplated the world. If he hadn't contemplated the world, if he hadn't seen the world, he couldn't have risen above it. The Buddha's enlightenment was simply enlightenment of this very world. The world was still there, gain and loss, praise and criticism, fame and disrepute, happiness and unhappiness were all still there. If there weren't these things there would be nothing to become enlightened to. What he knew was just the world, that which surrounds the hearts of people. If people follow these things, seeking praise and fame, gain and happiness, and trying to avoid their opposites, they sink under the weight of the world. Gain and loss, praise and criticism, 
fame and disrepute, happiness and unhappiness, this is the world. The person who is lost in the world has no path of escape, the world overwhelms him. This world follows the law of Dhamma so we call it worldly Dhamma. He who lives within the worldly Dhamma is called a worldly being. He lives surrounded by confusion. Therefore the Buddha taught us to develop the path. We can divide it up into morality, concentration, and wisdom develop them to completion. This is the path of practice which destroys the world. Where is this world? It is just in the minds of beings infatuated with it. The action of clinging to praise, gain, fame, happiness and unhappiness is called world. When these things are there in the mind, then the world arises, the worldly being is born. The world is born because of desire. Desire is the birthplace of all worlds. To put an end to desire is to put an end to the world. Our practice of morality, concentration, and wisdom is otherwise called the Eightfold Path. This Eightfold Path and the Eight Worldly Dhammas are a pair. How is it that they are a pair? If we speak according to the scriptures, we say that gain and loss, praise and criticism, fame and disrepute, happiness and unhappiness are the eight worldly dhammas. Right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration, this is the eightfold path. These two eightfold ways exist in the same place. The eight worldly dhammas are right here in this very mind, with the one who knows, but this one who knows has obstructions, so it knows wrongly and thus becomes the world. It's just this one one who knows, no other. The Buddha nature has not yet arisen in this mind, it has not yet extracted itself from the world. The mind like this is the world. When we practice the path, when we train our body and speech, it's all done in that very same mind. It's in the same place so they see each other, the path sees the world. If we practice with this mind of ours we encounter this clinging to praise, fame, pleasure and happiness, we see the attachment to the world. The Buddha said, you should know the world. It dazzles like a king's royal carriage. Fools are entranced, but the wise are not deceived. It's not that he wanted us to go all over the world looking at everything, studying everything about it. He simply wanted us to watch this mind which attaches to the world. When the Buddha told us to look at the world he didn't want us to get stuck in it, he wanted us to investigate it, because the world is born just in this mind. Sitting in the shade of a tree you can look at the world. When there is desire the world comes into being right there. Wanting is the birthplace of the world. To extinguish wanting is to extinguish the world. When we sit in meditation we want the mind to become peaceful, but it's not peaceful. Why is this? We don't want to think but we think. It's like a person who goes to sit on an ant's nest, the ants just keep on biting him. When the mind is the world then even sitting still with our eyes closed, all we see is the world. Pleasure, sorrow, anxiety, confusion, it all arises. Why is this? It's because we still haven't realized Dhamma. If the mind is like this the meditator can't endure the worldly Dhammas, he doesn't investigate. It's just the same as if he were sitting on an ant's nest. The ants are going to bite because he's right on their home. So what should he do? He should look for some poison or use fire to drive them out. But most Dhamma practitioners don't see it like that. If they feel content they just follow contentment, feeling discontent they just follow that. Following the worldly Dhammas the mind becomes the world. Sometimes we may think, oh, I can't do it, it's beyond me, so we don't even try. This is because the mind is full of defilements, the worldly Dhammas prevent the path from arising. We can't endure in the development of morality, concentration, and wisdom. It's just like that man sitting on the ant's nest. He can't do anything, the ants are biting and crawling all over him, he's immersed in confusion and agitation. He can't rid his sitting place of the danger, so he just sits there, suffering. So it is with our practice. The worldly dhammas exist in the minds of worldly beings. 
When those beings wish to find peace the worldly dhammas arise right there. When the mind is ignorant there is only darkness. When knowledge arises the mind is illumined, because ignorance and knowledge are born in the same place. When ignorance has arisen, knowledge can't enter, because the mind has accepted ignorance. When knowledge has arisen, ignorance cannot stay. So the Buddha exhorted his disciples to practice with the mind, because the world is born in this mind, the eight worldly dhammas are there. The eightfold path, that is, investigation through calm and insight meditation, our diligent effort and the wisdom we develop, all these things loosen the grip of the world. Attachment, aversion, and delusion become lighter, and being lighter, we know them as such. If we experience fame, material gain, praise, happiness, or suffering we're aware of it. We must know these things before we can transcend the world, because the world is within us. When we're free of these things it's just like leaving a house. When we enter a house what sort of feeling do we have? We feel that we've come through the door and entered the house. When we leave the house we feel that we've left it, we come into the bright sunlight, it's not dark like it was inside. The action of the mind entering the worldly damas is like entering the house. The mind which has destroyed the worldly damas is like one who has left the house. So the Dhamma practitioner must become one who witnesses the Dhamma for himself. He knows for himself whether the worldly damas have left or not, whether or not the path has been developed. When the path has been well developed it purges the worldly damas. It becomes stronger and stronger. Right view grows as wrong view decreases, until finally the path destroys defilements, either that or defilements will destroy the path. Right view and wrong view, there are only these two ways. Wrong view has its tricks as well, you know, it has its wisdom, but it's wisdom that's misguided. The meditator who begins to develop the path experiences a separation. Eventually it's as if he is two people, one in the world and the other on the path. They divide, they pull apart. Whenever he's investigating there's the separation, and it continues on and on until the mind reaches insight, vipassan. Or maybe it's vipassan 5. Having tried to establish wholesome results in our practice, seeing them, we attach to them. This type of clinging comes from our wanting to get something from the practice. This is vipassan, the wisdom of defilements, i.e. defiled wisdom. Some people develop goodness and cling to it, they develop purity and cling to that, or they develop knowledge and cling to that. The action of clinging to that goodness or knowledge is vipassan, infiltrating our practice. So when you develop vipassan, be careful. Watch out for vipassan, because they're so close that sometimes you can't tell them apart. But with right view we can see them both clearly. If it's vipassan there will be suffering arising at times as a result. If it's really vipassan there's no suffering. There is peace. Both happiness and unhappiness are silenced. This you can see for yourself. This practice requires endurance. Some people, when they come to practice, don't want to be bothered by anything, they don't want friction. But there's friction the same as before. We must try to find an end to friction through friction itself. So, if there's friction in your practice, then it's right. If there's no friction it's not right, you just eat and sleep as much as you want. When you want to go anywhere or say anything, you just follow your desires. The teaching of the Buddha greats. The supermundane goes against the worldly. Right view opposes wrong view, purity opposes impurity. The teaching grates against our desires. There's a story in the scriptures about the Buddha, before he was enlightened. At that time, having received a plate of rice, he floated that plate on a stream of water, determining in his mind, if I am to be enlightened, may this plate float against the current of the water. The plate floated upstream. That plate was the Buddha's right view, or the Buddha nature that he became awakened to. It didn't follow the desires of ordinary beings. It floated against the flow of his mind, it was contrary in every way. These days, in the same way, the Buddha's teaching is contrary to our hearts. 
People want to indulge in greed and hatred but the Buddha won't let them. They want to be deluded but the Buddha destroys delusion. So the mind of the Buddha is contrary to that of worldly beings. The world calls the body beautiful, he says it's not beautiful. They say the body belongs to us, he says not so. They say it's substantial, he says it's not. Right view is above the world. Worldly beings merely follow the flow of the stream. Continuing on, when the Buddha got up from there, he received eight handfuls of grass from a Brahmin. The real meaning of this is that the eight handfuls of grass were the eight worldly dhammas, gain and loss, praise and criticism, fame and disrepute, happiness and unhappiness. The Buddha, having received this grass, determined to sit on it and enter Samdhi. The action of sitting on the grass was itself Samdhi, that is, his mind was above the worldly dhammas, subduing the world until it realized the transcendent. The worldly dhammas became like refuse for him, they lost all meaning. He sat over them but they didn't obstruct his mind in any way. Demons came to try to overcome him, but he just sat there in Samdhi, subduing the world, until finally he became enlightened to the Dhamma and completely defeated Mersix. That is, he defeated the world. So the practice of developing the path is that which kills defilements. People these days have little faith. Having practiced a year or two they want to get there, and they want to go fast. They don't consider that the Buddha, our teacher, had left home a full six years before he became enlightened. This is why we have freedom from dependence 7. According to the scriptures, a monk must have at least five rains 8 before he is considered able to live on his own. By this time he has studied and practiced sufficiently, he has adequate knowledge, he has faith, his conduct is good. Someone who practices for five years, I say he's competent. But he must really practice, not just hanging out in the robes for five years. He must really look after the practice, really do it. Until you reach five reigns you may wonder, what is this freedom from dependence that the Buddha talked about? You must really try to practice for five years and then you'll know for yourself the qualities he was referring to. After that time you should be competent, competent in mind, one who is certain. At the very least, after five reigns, one should be at the first stage of enlightenment. This is not just five reigns in body but five reigns in mind as well. That monk has fear of blame, a sense of shame and modesty. He doesn't dare to do wrong either in front of people or behind their backs, in the light or in the dark. Why not? Because he has reached the Buddha, the one who knows. He takes refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. To depend truly on the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha we must see the Buddha. What use would it be to take refuge without knowing the Buddha? If we don't yet know the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, our taking refuge in them is just an act of body and speech, the mind still hasn't reached them. Once the mind reaches them we know what the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha are like. Then we can really take refuge in them, because these things arise in our minds. Wherever we are we will have the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha within us. One who is like this doesn't dare to commit evil acts. This is why we say that one who has reached the first stage of enlightenment will no longer be born in the woeful states. His mind is certain, he has entered the stream, there is no doubt for him. If he doesn't reach full enlightenment today it will certainly be some time in the future. He may do wrong but not enough to send him to hell, that is, he doesn't regress to evil bodily and verbal actions, he is incapable of it. So we say that person has entered the noble birth. He cannot return. This is something you should see and know for yourselves in this very life. These days, those of us who still have doubts about the practice hear these things and say, Oh, how can I do that? Sometimes we feel happy, sometimes troubled, pleased or displeased. For what reason? Because we don't know Dhamma. What Dhamma? Just the Dhamma of nature, the reality around us, the body and the mind. The Buddha said, don't cling to the five khandhas, let them go, give them up. Why can't we let them go? Just because we don't see them or know them fully. 
we see them as ourselves, we see ourselves in the kandas. Happiness and suffering, we see as ourselves, we see ourselves in happiness and suffering. We can't separate ourselves from them. When we can't separate them it means we can't see Dhamma, we can't see nature. Happiness, unhappiness, pleasure, and sadness, none of them is us but we take them to be so. These things come into contact with us and we see a lump of it, or self. Wherever there is self there you will find happiness, unhappiness, and everything else. So the Buddha said to destroy this lump of self, that is to destroy Sakhyaditha. When it, self, is destroyed, and it, non-self, naturally arises. We take nature to be us and ourselves to be nature, so we don't know nature truly. If it's good we laugh with it, if it's bad we cry over it. But nature is simply Sankras. As we say in the chanting, Tisam Vipasamo Sukho, pacifying the Sankras is real happiness. How do we pacify them? We simply remove clinging and see them as they really are. So there is truth in this world. Trees, mountains, and vines all live according to their own truth, they are born and die following their nature. It's just we people who aren't true. We see it and make a fuss over it, but nature is impassive, it just is as it is. We laugh, we cry, we kill, but nature remains in truth, it is truth. No matter how happy or sad we are, this body just follows its own nature. It's born, it grows up and ages, changing and getting older all the time. It follows nature in this way. Whoever takes the body to be himself and carries it around with him will suffer. So A.A. with Makron Kandana recognized this whatever is born in everything, be it material or immaterial. His view of the world changed. He saw the truth. Having got up from his sitting place he took that truth with him. The activity of birth and death continued but he simply looked on. Happiness and unhappiness were arising and passing away but he merely noted them. His mind was constant. He no longer fell into the woeful states. He didn't get overpleased or unduly upset about these things. His mind was firmly established in the activity of contemplation. There. A.A. with Makron Kandana had received the eye of Dhamma. He saw nature, which we call Sankras, according to truth. Wisdom is that which knows the truth of Sankras. This is the mind which knows and sees Dhamma, which has surrendered. Until we have seen the Dhamma we must have patience and restraint. We must endure, we must renounce. We must cultivate diligence and endurance. Why must we cultivate diligence? Because we're lazy. Why must we develop endurance? Because we don't endure. That's the way it is. But when we are already established in our practice, have finished with laziness, then we don't need to use diligence. If we already know the truth of all mental states, if we don't get happy or unhappy over them, we don't need to exercise endurance, because the mind is already Dhamma. The one who knows has seen the Dhamma, he is the Dhamma. When the mind is Dhamma, it stops. It has attained peace. There's no longer a need to do anything special, because the mind is Dhamma already. The outside is Dhamma, the inside is Dhamma. The one who knows is Dhamma. The state is Dhamma and that which knows the state is Dhamma. It is one. It is free. This nature is not born, it does not age nor sicken. This nature does not die. This nature is neither happy nor sad, neither big nor small, heavy nor light. Neither short nor long, black nor white. There's nothing you can compare it to. No convention can reach it. This is why we say Nibna has no color. All colors are merely conventions. The state which is beyond the world is beyond the reach of worldly conventions. So the Dhamma is that which is beyond the world. It is that which each person should see for himself. It is beyond language. You can't put it into words, you can only talk about ways and means of realizing it. The person who has seen it for himself has finished his work. Footnotes One given at Wat Nang Papong to the assembly of monks and novices in October, 
1968. Two kandas, the five groups which go to make up what we call a person. Three nature here refers to all things, mental and physical, not just trees, animals etc. Four slabata parmsa is traditionally translated as attachment to rites and rituals. Here the venerable Ajahn relates it, along with doubt, specifically to the body. These three things, Sakhyaditha, Visakich, and Slabata Parmsa, are the first three of ten fetters which are given up on the first glimpse of enlightenment, known as stream entry. At full enlightenment all ten fetters are transcended. 5. Vipassan Pakalisa, the subtle defilements arising from meditation practice. 6. Mra, the tempter, the Buddhist personification of evil. To the meditator it is all that obstructs the quest for enlightenment. 7. A junior monk is expected to take dependence, that is, he lives under the guidance of a senior monk, for at least five years. 8. Rains refers to the yearly three-month rains retreat by which monks count their age, thus, a monk of five rains has been ordained for five years.